The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant has detected a record level of radioactive cesium in groundwater. It was found in water samples taken from a newly dug well about 50 meters from the ocean. The Tokyo Electric Power Company workers detected 54,000 becquerels per liter of cesium-137 in the water. This is 600 times the government standard for radioactive water that can be released into the sea. And it's more than 30,000 times the level found in water samples taken from a nearby well last week. TAPCO officials believe the radioactive water is leaking from an underground tunnel that extends from the reactor buildings toward the ocean. They say they've been taking measures to prevent the tainted water from reaching the sea, but have yet to determine the exact With source. The International of Atomic Energy Agency have lent their expertise to the people in charge of Fukushima Daiichi, and they're telling them to examine all options necessary to treat contaminated water at the nuclear plant. They say the operator should consider more controlled releases of radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. Japanese officials invited IEA experts to return to the complex to assess efforts to scrap reactors. The inspectors visited the plant in November. They've just released the final report they submitted to the Japanese government. Team leader Juan Carlos Lentijo says Japan has established a good foundation to improve its strategy. And he says it's allocating the necessary resources to decommission the plant safely. But Lentijo says there will continue to be challenging issues that must be resolved to ensure the plant is stable over the long term. The report says managers at Tokyo Electric Power Company should bolster their efforts to treat contaminated water. They would need to bring down the levels of radioactivity. Then the report says they should examine resuming controlled discharges into the ocean. The report says first TEPCO officials should assess the safety of releasing the water and how it might affect the environment. <laughs> of a Japanese government panel are looking down the road in drawing up plans for energy policy. Their draft defines nuclear power as an important basic energy source. But some lawmakers say it should only be transitional. Lawmakers from the ruling Liberal Democratic Party handed their proposal to Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga. They want the energy policy to be consistent with their party line. It calls for an economy and a social structure that do not have to rely on nuclear power. The lawmakers are requesting that the energy policy include a roadmap to lessen the dependence on nuclear power. They want to stop construction of any new reactors, and they want to end the reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel. Modern medicine generally attributes the development of cancer cells to genetic abnormalities. However, Japanese researchers say they found another possibility. The research group is led by Professor Yasuhiro Yamada of Kyoto University. Researchers experimented by producing iPS cells in mice. They stopped work after one week. That's far short of the usual 28 days spent activating a certain gene. They then found that cancer cells had developed in the mice instead of iPS cells. The cancer cells were genetically normal. This directly contradicts the conventional medical theory that cancer cells develop as a result of the cumulative effects of genetic abnormalities. We are trying very hard and working together to achieve a result that will directly lead to the treatment of cancer patients. Professor Yamada says he and his team want to find out if they can obtain similar results in human People cells. People in Japan are noticing a tasty trend in communities across the country. More and more so-called farm markets are sprouting up.
There were 17,000 of them at last count. Customers love the cheaper prices and the fresh produce. Managers of one market have found a way to ensure their apples are even crisper and greens even greener. Every year, more than a million people pull into this car park in Utsunomiya, north of Tokyo. This is one of Japan's busiest farm markets. Last year, it sold over five million dollars worth of produce. There's a huge variety of fruit and vegetables, all sourced from 150 local farms. The big draw is price. Most items cost 10 percent less than in an ordinary supermarket. <laughs> There's such a great variety. I shop in many different places, but I always end up coming back here. The secret to the market's success? A great selection of produce that's literally farm fresh. Nothing is left to chance. Each purchase is logged and analyzed at the cash register. The data is then sent direct to suppliers, the farmers themselves. Akemi Ikeda supplies more than 30 varieties of vegetables to the market. Even out in the fields, she's kept in the loop. It's from the farm market. Each farmer gets data on their sales sent to them by text message once an hour. 20 bunches of chrysanthemum greens. I'll pick some more straight away. Right away, Ikeda starts pulling up more of the grains. She and her husband tie them in bunches and then rush them over to the market. This is how the market always keeps its produce fresh, by adjusting supply to meet demand in real time. It's really encouraging to see how much I've sold each day. It's great. This just-in-time supply system was set up by the market's manager, Yuzuru Matsumoto. Matsumoto has overseen a sharp rise in business. In the past five years, the number of visitors has risen by over 25 percent. We try to look at it from the customer's point of view and give them the service they want. We're always looking to improve the way we do things. There's another factor that helps to motivate the farmers. The market lets the growers set their own prices for their produce. It takes just a 15 percent commission. Everything else goes to the farmers. The farmers coordinate closely with the market staff in deciding which vegetables to grow. As for spinach, between December 27th and the 31st, we were about 300 kilograms short. I'm thinking of sowing some after my tomatoes. If I put in two to three hundred square meters, that should be about right. Holding regular meetings like this has changed the way the farmers think about their crops. Makoto Watanabe started working the land seven years ago. He now grows six kinds of carrots. Most of these are new varieties that he'd never thought of before. It's really fun coming up with new products to sell and ways to create a market for them. I think the producers feel much more involved as participants in this business. From the field to the market and then straight to customers. It's an approach that works for everyone. Catherine, it's a white Valentine's Day for Tokyo for the first time in three years. It's getting white outside of the studio uh, and we are, seeing, we are forecasting that snow and winds are picking up into the next several hours. So from a late afternoon, even blowing snow could happen. So you may want to go home early because some traffic disruptions could occur. Now the heavy snowmaker is now situated to the south of the country and it's expected to move towards the east while 
intensifying. Uh, so we're expecting widespread snow showers for many areas. This is the snowfall outlook into the next 24 hours. The heaviest snow will be found in the central region, up to 50 centimeters, mainly for the mountainous areas. Uh, for the low-lying areas in the Kanto region, up to 15 centimeters, and the greater Tokyo area, probably up to 10 centimeters. Last time we had heavy snow uh, on the weekend, it was 27 centimeters on the ground. So it's not going to be as heavy as the last one. However, 10 centimeter is quite heavy for the Tokyo residents. Now, on top of that, winds are going to be very, very strong, gusting about 126 kilometers per hour. You cannot stand without a support, and waves could hit as high as 7 meters. Uh, so, and this is a very slow moving system, so conditions will remain on the nasty side into tomorrow. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for staying up late with us. We have new findings tonight focusing on a major concern about the proposed nuclear waste site at Yucca Mountain. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission released a report that could play a crucial role in determining the safety of transporting radioactive waste to the mountain. In this News 3 exclusive, Christine Kim breaks down the 500-page study. The fight over putting nuclear waste on Yucca Mountain is a very complicated issue that's been going on for decades. But one commissioner with Nye County believes that a new report out about transportation risks actually address a number of concerns made by those opposing the project. The spent fuel transportation risk assessment focusing on a looming question. How safe is it to transport radioactive waste to Yucca Mountain? Let's hear the science. Nye County Commissioner Dan Schenhofen is a liaison to nuclear waste issues and represents those living closest to Yucca Mountain. People who say they don't want it in their backyard, well, it comes through our bedrooms. According to the assessment, there is a one in a billion chance radioactive material would be released during an accident. The material that will go to Yucca Mountain is spent fuel rods, and there's small ceramic pellets that are in these long rods that are put in a container, and then they're put in a cool, pool to cool, then they're put in a container to put on the truck, and then they're put in a container on the truck. They're, they're like triple wrapped, and then they're shipped. It notes even in the worst case fire accidents, the cask would stay sealed, meaning radioactive material would not escape. There's nothing leaking out of these things. There's nothing, you can stand next to the rail cars or next to the trucks, and it's, it's not any more dangerous than standing outside. But the findings also show canisters transported through railroad without the inner welded cask would release radioactive material in severe accidents. However, if someone is exposed to the waste, it would not result in immediate death. Overall, though, the study reconfirms the risks are very small and the public is protected. But in the past, Nevada's leaders expressed their opposition to the project. I do continue to oppose the Yucca Mountain project, and from a state perspective, I will continue to oppose it in, in any way we can. There are very few people who are required to watch waste once it's put into the ground. We don't want to make that kind of deal. But Schenhofen points to this new study and believes the science so far shows transporting the material to Yucca Mountain is safe. It's likely this new report will be brought up again in the near future. A legislative committee on high-level waste is scheduled to meet on February 21st at the Grant the Sawyer waste Building. isolation pilot plan has been part of the New Mexico landscape for a while now. Stuart Dyson's in the newsroom with the background story. Stuart. Tom, to start at the beginning, you just have to go back about 250 million years when an ancient sea evaporated, leaving vast salt beds there in the desert, and eventually they got covered up and buried uh, with desert sand. Some people say it's a perfect place for storing nuclear waste. Of course, a lot of environmentalists disagree with that, and that's one reason it took so long for WIP to get going. The federal government picked out the location in 1973, but the first load of waste didn't arrive till 1999. The place is not a sausage factory, so we do want to know what's in there. It's low-level waste, not bomb components, but stuff that's been contaminated with plutonium and uranium, like gloves and jumpsuits and tools and rags. The stuff comes from Department of Energy labs and plants around the country, places that produce nuclear fuel and weapons, like Los Alamos National Lab. It's all packed into super secure containers that are trucked in and packed away in 56 storage rooms carved out of the salt 2,000 feet underground. 
the future? WIP is scheduled to keep on receiving nuclear waste for another 20 years or so. Then workers will collapse those salt caves and uh, seal the place off with concrete and dirt, the salt helping to seal things in there. Some of the stuff inside there will stay radioactive for about 24,000 years.